Hello. So we are back online. Quickly check with the people in the chat if they can hear us and see us. <clears throat> Excellent. So everything is working. So we still have, uh, it's still our day four. And uh, we are still going to cover topics somewhat related to the reproducibility that uh, was covered in the morning by Demo and Thomas. And now here with me, there is Hossein, who works with me at Alto University. Hello, Hossein. Hello, everyone. I'm Hossein, one of the RSEs at Alto University. Happy to be here. Yes, today was a special RSC Research Software Engineers Day because basically, except me, all the others were Alto RSCs. RSC is actually a great profession if you want to stay in research, but not exactly becoming, you know, a professor or whatever you will become. But anyway, to the topic of this afternoon, it will be about uh, social coding. This uh, lesson used to be called licensing, software licenses specifically. As you might know, when you release something, you want to attach a license. And that, of course, doesn't even, it's not just limited to software because honestly, anything you basically create, whether you want it or not, it comes with a license. And the lack of license basically means copyright. But sometimes you might not even know that, let's say, what you write in social media has a certain license so that the owner of the social media platform can do almost whatever they want with your content. But today we will focus on these coding aspects. So, Osen, what do you feel about social coding and open software? Um, I think it's a very important aspect because uh, collaboration happens all the time. And uh, you should be able to understand the basics of it and how to share your code and uh, what kind of licenses to add it and uh, to take care of all of these things. Uh, I remember uh, reading this blog post from um, um, a random blog, I don't remember the name, but it was about Google Docs and uh, about the licensing that you pr probably agree and uh, you are giving almost the ownership of the work that you are doing on Google Docs to Google because you don't read the licenses and you don't take it seriously. So I think it's very important to know about the licenses and uh, how to, um, yeah, how to manage. Yeah. Them. Yeah, I agree. And here for some motivational example that you find some great code, but then you aren't sure, can you actually, you know, use it? Can you actually cite them? Or you need to modify the code a little bit, as we will call it later, like remixing maybe even with some data. But then what happens, especially in academic journals, that they require you these days to also publish the code. And the reason is not just the reproducibility reason that we heard from the first part of today's, but it's also related to basically the research integrity, the transparency principle of research, that you should be transparent in all the steps of the scientific, of the research process, and being transparent with the code is, is getting more and more popular. So you will see this type of code availability statements that you need to attach to your paper that you submit or data availability statements for, for the data part. And when it's time to write this statement, you need to basically have a license to your code, attached to your code and attached to your data. Yeah. Yes. So let's... Uh, Hopefully this was motivational enough. What I was saying is keeping a look at the notes documents. So please, if there's any questions and if you feel writing any comment related to the topic, just write to the notes. And then I was saying, please let me know if there's any anything interesting to highlight. So as I mentioned earlier, at the beginning, this lecture used to be called... Um, software licensing, but then it expanded into social coding. And the reason is that um, coding is not just something that happens in isolation, that especially in the in the topic that we, that we are discussing here, especially in the topic of research, 
at some point you are asked to share the code with others. And as we've seen uh, during the first lecture and also during the first week, sometimes you want to share the code with yourself. So the social part is not just, you know, me collaborating with Osain on a project and I don't know, sharing the GitHub and so on. But then it, it really goes, uh, you know, me collaborating with the future self and more in general, me trying to share what I wrote as a as a code to create an impact on uh, on other on other papers. So I was saying, what about you? I guess maybe that in your work as a research software engineer, you've been helping people kind of reaching this objective to to basically be social with their code and sharing it and make it citable. Yes. It, was um, it a, was it a easy easy job or was it? A... Um, to my experience, people started a bit late. They usually come when they have to publish the code because of a publication or a specific requirement for a journal. Uh, so they didn't start with social coding and like trying to have it uh, online for more co collaboration. Uh, so yeah, I think um, maybe if you started from scratch, it would be easier in the end. Uh, but yeah, that's yeah. This is a very good point. In a way, you could even pretend from the day zero when you start the project, when you start your Git repository, even though it's a private repository, even though you're not already sharing it with anybody else, you could still pretend that you know you are actually it that, that it's already live, that it's already public, and that already will improve the way you relate to the to the repository because maybe you will write meaningful messages if you know that you're being watched. If you know what I mean, even though maybe it's still a private repository, but that will also make your life easier when it's time to open it and share it with your paper that you don't need to, I don't know, go through the Git history, trying to delete commit messages that you were not happy about because you were very angry with your code on that day and so on. So in this um, social one, think about if and how you share. There's a question that um, can have multiple answers, and I believe uh, you have pasted it to them. Yes. Or, or can you paste it to them? Yes, I already did. Uh, someone had a problem with Twitch, but now it has been resolved. So maybe we can go to the questions. So basically, as we did in other polls, if you are able to write a like a O, so that we can get this type of ASCII, yeah. ASCII, ASCII histogram. So, so for the first yeah. question, you can answer as many as you want, but for the next ones, uh, you can only choose one. So say I'm gonna ask you the question, why would you want to share your scripts, code and data? Which one would you pick of this? Um, so for me, uh, it uh, it's like uh, it's very good for your reputation and for your CV if you want to change your job or maybe in the future, uh, which is a good thing because you can showcase that what 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 I was doing uh, in my previous job. Uh, another thing is uh, at least for me when I start to publish my code, I'm a bit more careful on the structure and try to be more clean. Uh, which is also a good thing. Uh, another thing that um, at least I use is um, because the code is more clean, it's easily more reproducible for me at least. Uh, so I think this is, these three are the main aspects that yeah. I use the social coding. What about you? Like, do you have any preference? Yeah, I I agree with you, especially like that you mentioned this. Um kind of CV idea. Yeah. And um, this also goes with the, in my opinion, what I like about the code refinery workshop, that the type of skills that you learn here are skills that are reusable in other fields outside academia. Yeah. So if the majority of the people following this workshop right now are doctoral, doctoral researchers or postdocs or whatever, mm -hmm. but um, already learning it and starting, you know, with whatever, yeah. Little, little by little sharing, it will also, you know, open doors for maybe other jobs in the future that might not be related to academia. Yeah. 
me yeah. of the options here are really like the the kind of um, the reproducibility part i'm biased i'm a reproducibility yeah. <laughs> fanatic so that other people can truly you know rerun my code but sometimes i've published code that was really ugly but i still thought i'm gonna put it out there because no one had the, that type of function in whatever language i was publishing it and then i saw that my ugly code oh. was actually reused by so many publications in completely different fields and, so and Rico, sorry to interrupt uh someone yeah. is mentioning that oh no sorry go ahead uh there was a comment that uh they, they cannot hear us but uh apparently it was from okay. the computer sorry go ahead right. yeah that's good <laughs> Yeah, if I was muted, it wouldn't be nice. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, let's have a look at what the, our people online are answering. Looks like that, uh, to my eyes at least, A and B seems to be very popular. So the reproducibility and also the trustworthy. Exactly. Um, it's interesting that the uh, H uh, is uh, it doesn't get, get any votes. Not for this year, also for previous years, it didn't get any votes either. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah. It's it's nice also this that maybe the kind of social thinking of the people here mm -hmm. is not that we are in a competition, even though the yes. grant system makes us believe that we are all competing with each other. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I wanted to add is maybe another aspect that I think about is being part of the community. So there are like a lot of co codes that we can use and are open source, so you can try them. And if you try to also publish your code, you become part of this community, which is very, very interesting to be part of. And uh, like you can create, uh, like collaborate with others. And uh, after some time, you will be known for some of your work. Uh, although they not might be exactly your expertise. For example, like I have this, it's not exactly a source code on GitHub, but it's about like a, uh, like, how to do something like more of administrative work. And at the moment I'm known for that work among like non-expert people for like research softwares, which is which is which is an interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. And in my opinion it's also I mean it's 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 exactly this that um, it's in even though we will talk about this later, that sometimes maybe code you might feel that you're not recognized in uh, you know citation or whatever impact mm -hmm. is the measure in, in academia. Yeah. But at the end of the day, people will notice it and, and people will see it. Maybe you, you start, you know, getting new collaborators or, you know, reaching people that you would have not just reached with your with your papers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe that we can go to the next question. Yeah, so... Uh, it, so with, it also yeah. had some it down flaws a bit, right? Like... So when you publish your code, do you have any concerns or? Well, I would say initially I felt this kind of B that my code is ugly. I was never really afraid of the A mm -hmm. because um, actually by publishing it with the timestamp, I could eventually prove that, you know, you scooped my code. I have a timestamp yeah. that shows. But then at the end of the day, would I really see you, someone else like me, for, for what just I, don't know. I mean at the end of the day I'm happy if people scooped whatever I did it means mm -hmm. that it was a, something good yeah but what about you out of these answers which one um I think for me B like being has have an ugly code was the most concern um I I never thought about like A or F about like a, a, a lower quality um, copy or even F, like the code could be stolen because you can add licenses. And it also is true about your your original paper, right? When you're publishing your idea, it can be also stolen, but it's completely okay. Like we have like patents and everything to to have this protection. And yeah. here I think it's the, the equivalent is licenses, which we will talk about. Um, yeah, it looks at yeah. B is also the most popular exactly another thing that i i have some concerns about which is not here is like because no software is complete right and as a perfectionist i'm always thinking about is it complete is it good enough to be published not from like being ugly or like not uh, following the clean code structures 
but just uh, as a as a whole like with all of the functions and like is it complete to be published or or no yeah i personally like the release early release often and so i rather just publish something that is even half broken but already Mm. Yeah. there's an idea out there and then i will improve and then maybe someone will try to reuse it and i realize that i completely missed i don't know one exception in the conditions and so on Yeah. So like based on age, uh, I can see like other people have this perfectionist idea as well. yeah And uh, it's good that I like I had some votes on, about the licensing, which we are going to talk about in this course, in this section. then we have question three and question four which are kind of free form so please expand on that and now we will have a look why is software often treated differently than from papers because some people for example also have an ugly English, <laughs> ugly way of writing. Why wouldn't you be ashamed of your ugly paper rather than your ugly software? And then the fourth question is uh, when you find a repository with a code or with a library that you would like to, to reuse, what are the things that you look at to decide whether you will use it? So let's have a look at the question three. Yeah, I like the first answer because it's this overly fixation with citations and metrics. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also true about like one of the comments is uh, it's usually seen just as a tool, not a scientific product. And it's kind of true, right? Because in my opinion, like papers are more about the results and the methodology that you used. And the code is just a tool that you did it. Although like there are some aspects about like optimization of the code and how fast it is, how much memory does it use. Uh, but in the end, uh, it's just a tool to achieve your goal, right? Yeah, it's true. Mm. It's nice though that now this, or at least I think that it's nice. I'm sorry for some people, maybe this would be more work and maybe they don't have the resources to ask for help. Mm. But this um, making, or I wouldn't say forcing, but at least trying to in, have the the code attached with the with the paper, with this software availability statement, is a little bit step towards this uh, reproducibility and yeah transparency so that it's clear that kind of maybe the method section is more meaningful if i can just read the code rather than try to infer from the paragraph from a very short paragraph in the method section which filter was actually applied or which machine learning whatever Mm algorithm was used -hmm. yeah uh, in question three do you agree with the last comment uh, not peer reviewed Well, kind of yes, unfortunately, because I, 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 I often review papers, and if there is a code, I spend a bit of time in giving some feedback. That, for example, usually the the typical feedback is that the license is missing, and Yeah. so in my feedback I say, please add the license to your code. But then on the other end, I don't have the time to actually rerun unless they make it very easy for you that it's just one Docker pull, whatever. command that you can easily rerun the whole pipeline and test it but even even though i would be kind of a expert to peer review the code there's just not enough time if i have to i'm far reviewing the paper but of course there are journals that are actually focused focused on this like the journal of open soft open source software jos where the peer review is actually on the code the actual papers that come with jos are one or two pages Mm. Um, we are a bit behind time so maybe we can continue but uh, a short comment that I wanted to add is it's a bit complicated than papers because if your repository become pop popular enough other people would come and do contribute to it right so it's not exactly peer reviewed but somehow it is right because other people are trying to make it better but yeah maybe we can continue uh Yeah, so then the question four is about when you find some code, you know, I see that many are writing about the license, which mm -hmm. it seems that it's already clear that the license might set the rules of what you yes can do and what you cannot do. 
and also this type of not just the reusability but what we will talk soon is this um, changes that you can do to the code so the so-called okay. derivative work do you have any comment on this also uh, personally I, I i see like the activity and the number of like when it has been updated recently or is it deprecated already and also another thing which i usually look at is the number of contributors that the, that the repository had um yeah yeah all right so basically the rest of this social coding part is what we just discussed that compared to sharing papers sharing code is somewhat different if the paper is just you know sharing your ideas and maybe winning citations code is a little bit more complex feature sometimes people will just reuse your code ID. sometimes it will form some sort of base base in basement foundation for something else to build on top and so you know with this uh, of course this makes it a little bit more complicated that papers to evaluate what could be the impact what could be the metrics eventually there are some metrics through that we will also mention later when you can actually uh, track the downloads of a, of a package of a software for example and then another aspect that is covered here in this page is what we touched already that the journal policies are basically going towards the I wouldn't say forcing but at least making it clear that there should be a code availability statement attached with the with the paper. Similarly, as we have a data availability statement, maybe sometimes you can't share the code because you're, I don't know, working with a company or it's a dual use case or whatever is the reason that you're not allowed to share the code. But it's clear that um, that the journals and not just the journals, even the, the organizations that are the, the funding organization, whether it's the European Research Council or whatever country organization, they are clearly making it stronger that the scientific code should be published and public. Mm -hmm. um, maybe out of one last part that we can look from this page is that is also this aspect this that we touched in the question above that sharing software can also be scary. Mm -hmm. And we touched a little bit on this. We didn't really cover the aspect of bugs and mistakes. Of course, we might be scared that what I did was wrong. But on the other hand, is it so bad? Um, maybe I should actually, from the perspective of science, from the perspective of ethics, I um, would be actually very happy that someone finds a bug in my code. And maybe, mm -hmm. you know, of course, it's sad for me that I need to ask for a, for a retraction of the paper if it really, you know, changes all the, all the results. But... In theory, if science should be, you know, what's the word, self-fixing, yeah. maybe this publishing the code would also improve this type of mm -hmm. this type of process. Uh, true. Um, I would say, like sometimes fixing a bug requires a lot of work, and it's it's good that we can collaborate and um, help each other on that aspect. At the same time, it can be a bit overwhelming for the publisher of the code uh, that uh, you kind of seem, you kind of feel that you're responsible for fixing those if the if they're just raising the bug, not a solution. Yeah, that's a very good point. We don't have time to discuss this, but in the page, for those who want to spend some time reading the whole page, there's also this question that, you know, how do you feel, like, do you feel the pressure that in the moment that you put your code online, now suddenly people will start asking, can you add this improvement? Can you make it work on this, whatever older version of this operating system? Maybe I actually think the other way around that at the moment that I put it online, I'm actually removing the responsibility that, mm -hmm. that I'm saying, look, I managed to do this. I don't have time to work on this anymore for whatever reason. Please continue, make it better or ask for help. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah, basically we are slowly moving towards the um, licenses and we still have now 30 minutes to talk about that, which is basically how our work connects to the, to the works of others. So I'm turning page now, and now it's the page dedicated to software licenses. And um, I guess 
more or less everyone is familiar with the idea of copyright. There are different types of copyright. There are trademarks that protect the name of a of a brand, from for example, from impersonation. There are patents that um, patents usually are not related to software as an algorithm, but you can patent a system, for example, or in general, so-called technical invention. And then there's the copyright that is basically protecting the creative expression. And this can include a little bit of everything, whether it's music or photographs or writings and so on. It's also nice what it says here that this copyright is practically forever because it persists for 70 years after the lifetime of the author. Mm -hmm. But then maybe on the, what you will hear as a term, if copyright feels like, uh, you know, protecting your intellectual right, I also see a point of having a copyleft, basically making sure that other people can actually reuse your work and build on top of your work again in a, in a, in a legal way. Yeah. And so this brings us to the topic of derivative work, which is a term to say that from something, let's say Osain made something and put it in the open and I want to reuse bits of it. I want to maybe reuse some bits as they are, some Python functions, because I don't really have any improvements to go there. Or maybe I want to, you know, remix, resample, invent my own flavor on some whatever visualization part of the script that I sent it. And of course I can do this or like the question that maybe would be for myself, am I actually able to do this? Would OSINT work allow me to do this type of derivative work? Or is it that, you know, I can't actually even touch or run on my computer OSINT works? So this derivative work is actually when it comes to software it's not intuitive at all of what constitutes derivative work and me myself when i was attending my first code refinery many years ago i was actually kind of surprised that some of the options here are considered derivative work so in this question file for you please don't spy to the to the solution box can can you try to answer in the notes document which of these are derivative works? So derivative, you understand that you are basically remixing, reusing the existing code that you have found, you have found online. So maybe we let some time to answer because we don't want to spoil the fun. Um. Yeah, and we have some questions on the note I'm trying to answer. Is there any anything to highlight? Uh, I think two of them is uh, are coming from previous sections and copy pasted here. It's about Docker and Kubernetes and uh, the Conda environment, which I think okay. we can pass. Uh, but uh, a question is uh, when you when you license your code, does it belong to your employer or to you? How does it work? Yeah. Uh, so as usual, what I learned from the lawyers that the best answer is it depends. It depends of what type of agreement do you have with your with your employer. Usually it's uh, flexible in a sense that sometimes I've seen, and I'm not specifically talking about my university, my employer, but I've seen people writing, you know, copyright in my case would be Enrico Glerian dash Alto University. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, because software per se cannot be turned into patent unless you build a system around it. The employer, at least this public organization like universities, they don't really care much. But it's a different story if you would be working for a for a company where you can clearly understand that you as a coder or for a company, you don't own anything. And uh, and the employer clearly writes in the contract that whatever you produce. But the same is also, and it's not intuitive, it's also for data. And this is some a discussion that I often have with our with our researchers that they think because they collected the data, mm -hmm. interviews, measurement, whatever, that it's their data. And it's actually very rare that it's their data in the specific context of Finnish universities. If you are on your own money on your own grant, then it is your data, but 99% of the time it's actually the university owns 
owns the data. So yeah, in this sense, it's it's complicated. Um, yep, I, I I just want to add that it depends on the 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 policy of the company that you are working, and uh, I know even for some companies, if you are an employee there, even if you develop some code out of your working hours, it's still the code that you produce it belongs to the company. So All right. it really depends on the policy. Yeah, so you can't even code as a hobby <laughs> in some Um, cases. unfortunately, yeah. It depends All right. on the company's policy. Yeah, well, fair enough. Maybe it's the same, you know. You can think of musician that if you're making music that's out of your contract with your record label, maybe the record label manager gets angry. Yep. All right, but question five, there's some answers here. And basically, A to uh, D, they are all to be considered derivative works that um, that you know you download some code and then you uh, donate or you change the code and modify the code. Maybe what I kind of was surprised for me, and of course it depends that E and F can also be considered derivative work. So even though I'm taking OSINT repository, there's some Python package, and I just rewrite it in R. I might still be doing derivative work, you know, if I followed the same logic, the same function structure, the same. It would be different if I say would sit down with me without showing any code, tell me what the package is doing, and then I would try to, you know, code it based on the description. So it would be like that I would read or say paper on the description of this package and just put it in the paper. I try to write my own version. And so, yeah, this was a bit unintuitive for me, but it, on the other hand, it makes sense when things start to be kind of literal. It's also interesting, we don't have the, I would add another option here that, I don't know, you're using some chat GPT or copilot to generate code. Is it derivative work? Because this, this chat GPT large language models, they actually have ingested lots of software from, whatever open repositories but then they don't tell you who originally wrote a function very similar to the one that you asked but then again it's 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 complicated do you actually do or saying if you if you use copilot or, or chat gpt to get help let's say with a function would you start searching if that function if bits of that function would already exist on the internet that then you would find a, a, not not that you have to, because this is also the, the thing that when you generate something with these um, large language models, you are actually become the copyright owner of what is generated, mm -hmm. which is counterintuitive in a way, because you feel that <laughs> ethically, it's not you that made those things, but just some machine who has read many, many code scripts. But how, how, how do you feel as a user of, because I, I guess you use you now sometimes these co-pilots or... Yep, all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, but I think it's a it's something that, like, as a society, we still have to think about it. Like, uh, what should what should we do? Because it's a generally, generally a new concept that we are facing, and uh, I think it would resolve and we would become like we we would come with a bit uh, more mature ways on how to cite it and how to use it. Uh, but personally, if I use something and I get some ideas or like use the whole functions that the generative AIs. Um, generates uh, no I don't go and search like what is the original repository that produced this one yeah this is of course I don't have an answer myself mm -hmm. and if people want to give their own opinion in my opinion it's nice anyway that people discuss this use of these new tools generative AI and how people are using them because maybe then we can come up with a consensus on a ethical and responsible way of using them um, we also have a question about like these generative AIs. Like uh, you said, if you generate something like piece of code, you would become the, the owner of the code, right? Is that correct? Yeah, the, the default policy is that whatever you generate with the large language model, you are the copyright owner. But do you add any like citations or anything that I use generative AI for this code that I created or? So the journals have um, expanded on their policies on the use of generative AI. And so now publishers like Nature or whatever, many publishers have a 
they would now basically require you to add the statement how generative AI was used in the in the process. I don't have a like I'm not too strong when I when I teach about these things. I can tell that if you just used it for I don't know fixing your English grammar, maybe it, there's, there's no point. But if it's clear that that work would have not been able without the use of generative AI, then of course it must be mentioned. So if I if my level of coding is very basic for whatever reason because I just started, and I get help from the generative AI, and I'm basically not able to judge myself, is this code that the generative AI made? right even though i see with the tests that i you know add that it it feels right at least i can be transparent that you know i got help or i used chat gpt for generating the code for this and and the code is published at this and that repository all right so so yeah when it comes to software licenses so now we are a bit focusing on software i've seen some people in the notes talking also about Creative Commons. We will touch a little bit on so-called data licensing later. But in general, uh, there is a taxonomy of software licenses. This was from the European Commission, yes. So it's a publication that basically um, talks about the EU public license, the European Union public license. And so when it comes to software licenses, there are different basically there's a continuum of um, things that would basically they are very dark green that you could basically do whatever you want with that type of license so if you find a code and with that code in i don't know github there is attached the license that says mit or bsd and so on it means that most likely you can reuse it and you can do anything anything you want you can build on it in some cases you don't even maybe need to tell who was the original author. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the so-called um, uh, strong copyleft licenses. Mm -hmm. And so here the idea is that um, if I find, let's say that OSINT writes a package um, that I want to reuse, but it comes with a strong copyleft license, it means that whatever I derive from OSINT work should also be released with that strong copyleft. So I need to use the same license. And in some cases, as they say, this license infects the rest of my code. So it's not just the code that is using OSINT's uh, strong copyleft work that needs to be released with that license it might attach my whole project and now i have to also release it with the with the strong copy left license and in between there are these more kind of share alike the idea of share alike is that okay i make this software uh public with this license but i wouldn't mind that if you improve the software you are kind of allowing me to basically get your improvement so that i can also reuse so it's it it's it's kind of in between the two, the very permissive one that lets anybody else to do whatever they want, and the very strict one that forces everybody else to do as you, as you decide to do. What is your feeling, or saying from a research software engineer perspective? Have you worked with the projects that have all sorts of licenses, or do you feel that in general it's more towards these permissive licenses? Um. Personally, I'm more like more like of the more open licenses like MIT or Creative Commons ones. Uh, and I my idea is I'm using other people's code, and if I'm able to publish the code, it's not something confidential or it's not an ongoing project that I cannot con I cannot publish yet. I would go with the more open licenses. Uh, but I can totally understand like for some of the projects, uh, it's better to have more copyleft uh, licenses or even a strong copyleft licenses. Yeah. Um, an interesting okay. thing is is about like this picture that we have is about the, about that arrows that we have. Can you also explain the what are the arrows and how does it work? Yeah, so here they call it, they talk about that the arrows represent compatibility. Mm -hmm. And so that in some cases, you know, some uh, licenses can kind of leave can be can be compatible with other licenses but in some other cases the compatibility you know when the like for example here 
so if I remember correctly, this uh, red block is more the proprietary licenses, and so the very permissive licenses are compatible with proprietary licenses, meaning that you can release a software that it's not going to be open source, and inside it uses some of the permissive libraries, but then here you see there's no compatibility between uh, if you something is released with a very strong compi left, then nobody can use it in a proprietary in a proprietary software. There's also here for those who want to explore more, there are this nice um, set of links that help you, for example, comparing licenses and choosing a licenses. There are different, there are many nice tools that given you, you might even answer some questionnaire of what you would like to do with your license and then they can recommend you this, whatever type of licenses. All right, so maybe I think we agreed that we will not do this exercise for the sake of speed. And we can now talk when should I add a license. So the best, of course, is as early as possible, like in with everything else, that if you agree at the beginning that you want to choose a certain license, then you choose it at the beginning, it's funny that with the GitHub interface, when you create a repository from the web interface, immediately it asks you, do you want which license do you want to attach with it? So you know the it's 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 clear, you know. And here I can see <laughs> citations to myself. What I was saying also earlier that if if you work from the very beginning as if your project is already public and open, then uh, you know you can already think at the very beginning that there's a license, that there's a policy, because of course in this uh, social coding part, we didn't really mention this earlier, but you might also want to recommend how people can contribute to the improvements of your code. You can you can create a community around your project and uh, tools like GitHub are easily, uh, allow you easily to, you know, create issues, create, uh, create discussions around your code. So, so basically, when should you add a license as early as possible? And how to add a license if your work is derivative work? So basically, these tools that I mentioned earlier that could check the compatibility would allow you to, to see that if you reuse some uh, specific package that might have permissive or strong copyleft licenses, then you can see what type of license you can, you can uh, basically attach to the to the code. In general, maybe one comment that um, at least when I was asking you or saying that you are in favor of more permissive licenses, what I wanted to add is that sometimes you have to think that the users of your software, those who will reuse is there are other people like you. So the permissive licenses, even though you might feel you are donating your code to the Google, Microsoft, Meta, whatever. At the end of the day, you're just making it easier for other people like you to reuse your code if you have a permissive license. With more copyleft licenses, they're of course very ethical and it's nice that some projects are strong copyleft and they demand that the, you know that whoever uses those projects also becomes strong copyleft. But when it comes to researchers like us, sometimes it, we might just make the life more complicated when the researchers need to publish their code with their papers. So at the end of the day, if you aren't sure which one to pick, go with the most permissive licenses. Do you have any comment on this, uh, Hossein? Uh, no, it was perfect coverage. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So... Something that um, I think I got to see, like it's not an exact question on the, on the HikeMD, but I get a team that it's happening. Like, let's say a sorting algorithms, right? So do someone ha own the sorting algorithms and have license on them or only it depends on the implementation and the, the code has been, has been published? Yeah, I'm, you know, as usual, I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> I can't, don't take my words for a legal advice. But uh, in my understanding and in my discussion with legal experts, the idea, the algorithm, the pseudocode is not patentable. So if I write a book with pseudocode on how to do this, whatever sorting method, 
nobody can patent it. But in the moment that I make an implementation as a system that is reusable, kind of as a standalone system, so not just uh, writing the, the pseudocode into some code, then it can be patentable. So let's say that I have a web application where you copy paste your vector of numbers and then press a button and then my web application sorts your number in a very whatever fast way, mm -hmm. then this is a system and I can patent this web application for sorting numbers. But if I would just have the code that does the sort, I would not be able to patent that. But I can still protect it with a license so that I can say, okay, you want to use my sort, fast sort algorithm, then I don't know, use, I'm going to attach a very copyleft license. You have to make everything open if you use it. Uh, yep. Thanks. Let's see if there's any other question to bring up. It's uh, nice that there's many answers already so that we don't have to. Yeah. That's why I was a bit silent. I was trying to expand it to the best of my knowledge. Uh, but uh, there are other contributors too. Thanks, everyone. In general, this um, there's also sometimes what could happen is that um, things might change in time. Mm -hmm. So that maybe a project start with a certain license, but then for whatever reason, you realize that, um, I don't know, you really need to adopt change the license to a more copyleft one because you started using some software that has a more copyleft license. So of course, licensing can change in time. Yeah. It's not preferable in a sense that if you would really need to apply this, you would kind of need to contact you know, your user base and tell them, okay, you've been using my code as permissive license, but from today, the license is, uh, is not permissive anymore. It becomes copyleft. So... Okay. Of of course, you know, things, and I mean, you might be familiar yourself that the terms and condition of whatever service that you use change in time so often that nobody even reads what is the new <laughs> change. So the same would, would also go, go here. Mm. So changing the license is not retroactive. And uh, if someone is still using the code, uh, you cannot, uh, like, um, you cannot change the, like um, does it apply to them or like how does it work yeah well again it depends because i would hope that it's not retroactive in a sense that if a release of a certain version of a software certain tool was released with let's say a very open permissive license mm -hmm. that i that i'm still allowed to use that you know open version of the software because maybe the company decided that from version 2.0 they went full copyright you know so maybe i'm still allowed to use version 1.0 but 2.0 i need to buy whatever the license from the company okay. but then there are also some other aspects maybe this is more related to data that can be uh, changes to the license of data that can be retroactive and the general data protection Regulation, the GDPR is one example of this. So that if I released open personal data 10 years ago, actually GDPR would affect the okay. license of that data and would not me allow me to keep it open anymore. So again, it depends, but, but it's clear, for example, for those who really are into, <laughs> into these legal matters, I would really recommend reading this um, this paper from the European Commission where they describe this type of license, the European mm -hmm. Union public license. It's a it's a bit of a, it's a share-alike license. So it's not in the most permissive, but it's also not in the most strong copy left. Okay. And what is what is interesting is then the European, the, the whatever projects related to the, to the European Commission, they are being released with this license. So that is clear that it's for the benefit of everyone that those who will reuse this code kind of make also their code in this uh, public license share like public license and then you know you can basically get what other people in made with your code and in and improve your code it's a little bit more work of course to to make sure that also the new code that you release also follows this um, the same type of share like license but this is kind of the best balance between, you know, being permissive and letting other people to use as much as possible and also being more ethical to kind of, you know, also get back from from what you give. 
Um, yeah, we also we have a comment from a user that uh, like the more open licenses uh, cannot be closed retro uh, retroactively, and yeah. also like if you have different versions or you you release a new version, you can change the license. Uh, but uh, as a standard for the soft free software, you cannot uh, change the existing license without changing the version of the code. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what I was saying as well. Yes. Yeah. Another thing that I wanted to ask is, uh, do you have any comments or thoughts on multi-licensing licensing, or like, do you usually use one license or um, what is the best practice here? Well, I mean, I, I see the point of having multi-licenses, dual licenses, because sometimes some, um, you know, some businesses, maybe maybe in, in the context of academic academic research, maybe there's not much point. But uh, if some of the research turns into a business idea or, you know, if companies want to have a mixture of uh, copyright, private code and public, there is a benefit that, you know, that if, you know, if, if something is used for, I don't know, commercial purposes, then maybe you follow certain license. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but then again, I'm also a bit conflicted with these dual licenses because if one really looks at the open source uh, and open open source software licenses, it is clear that you 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 can't really impose what people can do with your with your with your code. That one of the advantages of the open source software licenses is that you know you're not liable yourself with whatever people will do, but also you can't control if people, for example, will use your code for doing something malicious. You can't block them with this, with yeah. these licenses. Um, yeah, but I guess that the, the takeaway here is like, you can use multiple licenses and uh, uh, which is a good, which can be a good practice if it's suitable for, for your case, for your data or for your sum of files, you can add a different license than the general license that you have for the whole repository. All right, I guess it's time for a little break. We yes. can um, come back, and maybe we can come back at the fourteen o'clock, um, or the or fourteen o one, fourteen o two. Yeah, ten minutes maybe. break. Yeah, maybe fourteen o two. All right. Okay. So let's have a little break, and we will be back in ten minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the, to the social coding section. We already talked about social coding and sharing your code, and also a bit of license about licensing. Uh, now we want to talk about software citations. We talked about like how code is a bit different than papers, and why there are different things that you have to consider. And citation is one of the things uh, which maybe is more similar and also a bit different than paper citations, I would say. Mm. So here in the screen, you can see we want to talk about fair principles first. So Enrico, what is fair principles? Yeah, so we touched on these fair principles also in the morning when it comes mm -hmm. to the reproducibility. And basically the fair principle is like, um, you know, the acronyms that would be findable accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And now, while this maybe is kind of easy to understand when it comes to data, because of course you want your data set to be findable by whatever search system, accessible, whether it's fully open or open on request. So, but at least there is a way to access it. Interoperable, which means that it can work with other tools. It's in a format that other softwares can open it and read it. And reusable so that there is, like we just discussed, a license that would give some principles on how to, to reuse it. To reuse it, the same fair principle for data, they can also be extended to software. And so again, that people can find your software, that they, they can access it, they can download it, interoperable so that it works with other system and that there is a clear way on how, how to reuse it with the clear licenses attached to the software, for example. So again, because sometimes people, you might think, okay, I put my software my scripts that I've done for this paper, I put them in my university homepage. 
or they are on GitHub and that's it. We always need to think a little bit long term. And I have to mention actually that me myself, um, I decided to use some GitHub repository from the university and then that repository is not there anymore. So now I have published paper that are pointed to some Git repository hosted by a department that doesn't exist anymore. And, and so some once in a while I get questions, where is the code now, you know? So there was a mistake on my side that I didn't actually create a so-called DOI, Digital Object Identifier or PID, Persistent Identifier. Because if I would have done that, another organization would have taken care of preserving my software for as many years as we can think of. Mm -hmm. And so what we see here in this make your code citable and persistent, the persistent part is exactly this. It's not enough to put it on your web page or to put it on uh, GitHub because GitHub maybe will change your account will be, I don't know, maybe you decide to delete your account and with that all your repository or by accident you even delete a repository because you thought that that was just a side, side project. So there are services like Zenodo which is hosted by CERN. And with, with Zenodo, you can basically um, get a digital object identifier for anything digital. It can be the software release, for example, or it can also be used for, for data sets that can be published. And so what is nice about uh, this uh, Zenodo repository is that um, it automatically can be linked with your open, with your available GitHub repositories. So that whenever you create a release on your GitHub project repository, Zenodo can actually automatically basically pull the new release so that you can basically have a permanent copy of your GitHub releases stored in, a, in, the, in the CERN data center. Have you ever published this type of DOI or have you helped anyone uh, with this type of getting a DOI for a software or saying? Um, yeah, uh, we were like helping a researcher to publish the code and uh, we had to use that and also explain this, explain the, the things that you already explained about why it's important to just have a DOI, DOI not on, and it's not only, it's not enough to only host it on your personal GitHub account, because in 10 years, GitHub can go down, right? We don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, uh, and people and researchers are already familiar with this because it's also a very similar aspect in publishing your paper as well. It's not enough to publish your PDF or PDF of your research on your personal uh, website or Google Drive. You have to have a DOI yeah. uh, to, to make it persistent for the future. Yeah, it's also nice that the interface that comes with the with the Zenodo website, if you see, if you search for some software, you can actually look at some metrics. Again, we don't do this for the metrics, but sometimes the metrics help us, mm -hmm. whatever motivate uh, our bosses, that um, you can look at metrics like number of downloads and number of citations so that, you know, you, you can also kind of, quantify a little bit the uh, impact that your software or scripts might have. Yes. What is here now, there's a checklist. Checklists are always useful because they're practical and you can basically see what is needed to make your software citable. And so assigning appropriate license, like we mentioned before the break, then we want to have a description of the software so that there is, you know, appropriate metadata format, clear version numbers, authors are credited. We get this persistent identifier like the DOI. Mm -hmm. And then even, you know, sometimes we won't tell in the, in the software which publication to cite because in some cases, some publications might be related. They're so-called software packages publications, but in some other cases, the main publication is about, let's say, some application of the software, but still you release the software along with the original publication. Recently, there's um, there's also the way that through your on your GitHub repository, you can also like a so-called machine-readable software citation file. So... CFF, so citation file format. 
and it basically looks something like this. So machine readable means that a computer, another computer can automatically read. And you see that these are like variables with the names and the values and some can be, you know, structure. It looks a bit like this um, YAML, YAML files. And so this, this pre kind of fixed metadata about the software makes it easier and makes it especially if, if you have, you know, search engines or, or specific publication engines that it's easy for these um, other tools to basically index your software and make it findable and accessible and so on with the FAIR principles. Mm -hmm. Git, GitHub now supports this citation CFF files. So if you name the file with this exactly like a citation.cff, it can already be automatically interpreted by by GitHub. And here there's some um, like a video how to create it and even a web. But in practice, if you are from if you're fine with it with using some text editor, it's uh, you can even take just this template and and reuse it. So anything else to add was is there anything in the notes document worth? Uh, no, we don't have any questions or comments till now. All right. Well, then, in general, also, this is one way to get your citations with the software. But in some cases, maybe your software, the contribution that you and your research group add to the software can be substantial. So that there can be papers that are truly about software. So full papers that they describe a software package. And then there are specific journals that accept this type of software papers. So then if I can kind of call back of someone was mentioning that sometimes software is not peer reviewed with this type of work, you can understand that it's the software even more important than the actual paper. And so it might go to more extensive peer review and checks and compatibility and so on. At the end of the day, like Jose mentioned earlier, it's maybe not the actual work of the two or three peer reviewers, but it's really the community that is around the software project. So if this uh, larger packages, they have a big community around and we can all be part of the community, whether it's just fixing a typo in the documentation or working on a, on a new release with the main developers mm -hmm. so that the peer review is truly a a dynamic process that basically never ends. It's not that when this software was published in 2021, it has not been touched. I'm sure that it has improved in the meantime and it has evolved and, and gotten better and better. Um, one note that I wanted to add is uh, like uh, the papers that only talking about the software are becoming more popular nowadays. And uh, for at least for a lot of Python libraries, uh, all, li all li libraries, you can see they published a paper and uh, it's also good for the researchers as well because they get many, many citations, which is maybe not the case for your scientific paper. So consider on yeah. publishing the paper for your code as well, which is becoming more popular nowadays. Yeah, and it's true. And it, it's, it's nice that maybe this type of metrics like, uh, you know, maybe right now in the CV, in some standard CV that might not yet be space for your software packages, but these are catching up. So I can mention in Finland, there is the tank CV, which is one format used by the Finnish uh, grant agencies. And already there, they, they would have a section right now. They have a section right now that where one can add this type of extra non-typical paper type of publications or like software. All right, so we still have a... 10 minutes left and then of course we will ask about the feedback of the day the last part is about sharing data now there are many and um, better and more extensive uh, uh, talks online on uh, sharing data because as you can understand when it comes we discussed a lot about software sharing and contributing and reuse it but all the same could be said about data that uh, sometimes we might want to have a data set that is truly copyrighted and so nobody else can access and they need to ask you for a license or maybe they need to pay you. But some other times we might have a data set that you can fully release opening, whether because you decide to do so with your employer, with your supervisor, and of course everything in between. 
where you might want, like we had this share alike for the software, the same would be for the data that you share the data, but any derivative work done with the data should also be released with a similar license, for example. So when it comes to this um, where to actually share the data, what type of options are out there, this Zenodo repository is also mentioned in this case in uh, in Zenodo. So it's not just about sharing the release of your software, but you can share all sorts of data. And it's really nice that you can also share slides and um, white papers or anything that, that you feel like that can contribute to your scientific community. But Zenodo is not the only one. And so there are these other services. I'd like to at least mention the Open Science Framework that um, allows to to this type of sharing of nice data set in um, international context. The Open Science Framework is hosted in the United States. If I remember, Zenodo is in Switzerland. Figshare, I think now is bought by Nature Springer. EU dot is basically EOSC or European platform. And Dryad is also, I don't think it's public anymore or you, they might give you uh, non-profit, like a small, how do you call freemium <laughs> license? But uh, here then we will not go through this, but different countries, at least in the Nordics, where most of you are right now, there are different national services for sharing the data. And um, there are also resources for the so-called data management. Now, again, we will not expand much on here, but if you think that if Git was using for keeping versioning versions of your code, the same could be done with data so that you can version the version of the data set because you had version 1.0 that had some, I don't know, outliers, but then you have version 2.0 where you clean the data, remove the outliers and so on. So this type of tools like Data Lad, Data Stewardship Wizard, Git Annex, that is not mentioned here, but it's practice Data Lad, so they can help you basically keep also the versioning of the, of the data and not just of the code. And then when it comes to the licensing of data sets and databases with a specific type of, of data set, there are different um, there are different legislation that can cover this. And similarly, as we had for software, we can have something that is in the full spectrum from completely open public domain to completely uh, private copyright. So the type of licenses that you hear about data, they're so-called creative common licenses. There are different flavors with the CC0 being the so-called public domain where it's as open as possible. People can reuse it and they don't even need to cite you. And then more kind of restrictions on the reuse of the data, which could be that people need to cite you or people cannot do commercial work with that or this share alike that people need to reshare what they did with the data as you are doing with the data and and basically so on the, when it comes to the machine learning and ai things are of course getting a little bit more complicated machine learning models are in practice data so the model the weights on its own uh, they can't really be you, you can't do much with those unless you have a system to basically run the models and whether you are generating data or classifying whatever you're classifying but what is tricky and at least what is a bit blurred right now here in the context of uh, AI and machine learning models is that sometimes you hear things like open source models or open source language models but if one really would kind of look at the definition of open source, they are actually not open source. They sometimes people call open weights so that the models, the weights, the actual file, you can download it and reuse it, but you have no idea of how that model was done. So everything else basically around the, the model is, is actually not open at all. Here it mentions this um, artificial intelligence act 
which was became entered into force on the 1st of August of this year. And the AI Act adds some basically restrictions on what the researchers even can uh, basically open. If you're not planning to open anything related to your AI models, basically the AI Act lets you do whatever you want. But in the moment that you need to start sharing your model, you need to basically see if you would, if your type of machine learning model would fall inside of this um, so-called high risk or prohibited AI systems. And of course, there are different, um, how can I say, obligations, there are different legal obligations depending on what type of artificial intelligence systems you might be working on. In general, we have some material on these new topics that we will expand on this page. But if you have questions, of course, let them, please write them down in the in the chat. And then many nice links here that it would be nice to browse together, <laughs> but our time is soon over. Hossein, do you have any comments or is there anything to highlight from the, <clears throat> from um... the notes? No, uh, in the notes, we don't have any uh, as direct question to sharing data. We had some questions about software citations and uh, some about like um, accounts, but uh, not about the uh, sharing data. And yeah, um, yeah it, was, yeah. it was completely good. If you want to pick, if you need to choose one of these further readings and you have time to go deeper into all this reproducible research, opening data and opening software, I really recommend this Turing Way, which is an open book on all these topics. It's a nice read. It's You can read it. It's open. You can read it on your mobile phone during your commute. So if you really need to pick one, we recommend, I recommend the, the first one. And in general, I mean, it's it's nice that we are building a community together through Code Refinery. If you explore our pages, you can also get access to a chat. And in the, the chats that we use is called Zulip. And through the Zulip chat, you, you can join discussions. We can continue discussions on these topics. And um, we have all sorts of discussions there. So so that is... Um, that is something nice. We we already saw some participants from this workshop have already joined the Code Refinery chat. All right, so we still have eight minutes, which is a good moment for asking for feedback. So it would be great if on the notes we could paste the usual feedback for the day. If this was too fast, too slow, and I see that they are already there. I could actually switch to the notes view with my movie director interface. And so, yes, as usual, this, even though we give similar lessons in, um, in, um, over the years, that's, they're not always, they're never exactly the same. The phases are changing. We might update the lesson a little bit. And of course, what makes this unique is your questions and your experience. So please give us feedback. And if there's something you want to, you think that we could have covered more or less, please write it down. Then uh, tomorrow we have, um, we have the fifth day of the workshop. And tomorrow the topic will be documentation, which is kind of somewhat related with the topics of the day. So because along with the license, you also want to tell people not just how to use your code, but also how to maybe, you know, expand it, contribute to it and so on. And then the second part of tomorrow will be about Jupyter Notebooks. Maybe some of you are already familiar with this way of interacting with code and data. And um, hopefully for those who have never experienced this, it's uh, it's something that you can try out. Again, tomorrow will be like a demo day. So you're not expected to, to actually, you know, run things. But if you want to actually do and see what people are doing, whether you want to build the documentation 
and it, it's not just about documentation because with the same system that will be introduced tomorrow you can also it's the same system that we use to build our web pages our training materials they're all built with this uh, same system and so you know you can also learn how to create your website for example under this github.io uh, if you want and so if you want to test these things you please follow our installation instructions if you if you're planning to do that all right i think um, i see that people are commenting is there anything to highlight let me have a look at the chat um based on the feedback uh i think at least today was on track people were satisfied with the speed and also like some we have some comments that uh it was a bit too fast and there were like many okay. topics that we had to cover and uh unfortunately maybe it was a bit too fast if you don't have the recoil background or if you're not familiar with that with the subject it can be a bit overwhelming yeah this is exactly why we decided almost a year ago to not having exercises in this week too because sometimes not only there's lots of new topics on top of those try to run snake make locally or building a zenodo repository or how do you call it doi getting a doi through this another sandbox so we hopefully this is a little bit more digestible and useful and of course we provide you with all these links and other resources that those who really have time can can try themselves and please join our Zulip chat so that we can continue discussing there and helping you there if you want to try these things and you need further help. All right. So hopefully this was a good day four and I can maybe add also a reminder that day six will be more about um, coding related things we will cover things like automated testing and modular code development and then again if you want to do if you want to try the exercises that the um, instructors are going to show on the stream you can also you, you should basically also install what we recommend in our installation pages but then again it's just fine to participate through the questions and thank you again for the many questions there's almost 50 today so it was a great that you were so active also thanks for the participants who were active in answering other questions uh, thanks i see one question that is for me that is related to the one ect credit and mm -hmm. so yes in this case I try to be as clear as possible on that page, but if something is not clear, I'm happy to expand it. In practice, this means that if you are sure that your supervisor or study coordinator or whoever is able to accept a kind of an official paper from me that says that this person has completed the code refinery workshop, there are very simple homework to do for getting the certificate then uh, i will give you this document and then you can convert that into into a credit and uh, if you are at alt university you don't you just need to give me your student number and i will add the credit for you on our system but in general we don't track the if you were um, attending you know whatever days you were attending as long as you do the homeworks we can uh, you know we can give you we can give you the the credit okay so let's see if there's any other quick question to pick we still have one minute and a half Yeah, I think your point is covered. Yeah, I think most of the things are answered. Then, all right, maybe we can call it a day, one minute earlier. And um, 
Thank you for watching. The recordings will appear immediately on Twitch TV and later on the week on our YouTube channel. And so see you tomorrow for day five of Cold Refinery. Thank you, Osain, for being here with me. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye. Bye-bye.